This meeting will come to order. We have now. This meeting will come to order. This is a special session of the Bloomington Common Council for Wednesday, January 29th. Uh, can we, will the clerk please call the roll? Hello. Here. Scambalori. Here. Rosenbarger. Here. Sims. Here. Volan. Here. Piedmont Smith. Here. Flaherty. Here. Smith. Here. Sandberg. Here. Everyone is present. Thank you. Uh, to summarize the agenda, we will hear reports first from council members, then the mayor and city offices, including a report on uh, 2020's Black History Month activities. Uh, we will hear uh, the 2020 Council Sidewalk Committee report, and then we'll hear from the public. Uh, in legislation for second reading resolutions, we will hear resolution 2001 to establish standing committees and abolish other certain committees of the Common Council. We'll follow with the Council schedule, and then we will adjourn. Let us start with reports from Council members. I'll start, excuse me, on my left with Council Member Sandberg. No. Council Member Smith. No. Council Member Flaherty. No report. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Council Member Rallo. Council Member Scambaluri. Just briefly, I'd like to extend an invitation to my constituent meeting this coming Saturday at 1.30 in McCloskey, which is room 125, I think. Um, in a couple places, it was indicated that the start time is 1. It's actually 1.30. Um, so we've corrected that where we can. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Scambaluri. Council Member Rosenberger. Report. Council Member Sims. She's going to be fun listening to tonight. <laughs> um, I do have something briefly, a couple of comments I'd like to make. Um, first of all, I think many of you know that I am the campaign chair for uh, Monroe County United Way, and I'm pleased to announce that we have topped, um, just topped a million dollars, so we're getting close to our goal for this year, and we didn't publicize the goal because we've just got something we're shooting for. So. Um, I am proud of this community. It is a very, very worthwhile agency. Uh, those that have not donated and care to, I suggest that you do. Those that have donated already, such as myself, maybe we can dig a little deeper um, so we can help that middle area of folks in our community that need help. Um, one other thing, last evening I had the pleasure of seeing a new board member, Monroe County Community School board member sworn in. Um, as you know, I think Ms. Lois Scabo Skelton, Sable Skelton, thank you, um, retired and they held a caucus or an appointment meeting to replace her and selected was Ms. Jacinda Townsend Giddes. Um, she is an educator at Indiana University, um, African American woman, um, and I believe she has two children within the school system. And I've um, been pretty active um, from the social justice and social equity platform in this community. So I am looking forward to um, some of the positive energy that she'll bring to the board and some ideas and um, help make our school system better. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sims. I have no report, so we will now go to reports from the mayor and city offices. We'll hear the, a report on 2020 Black History Month activities. Ms. Moss, hello, welcome. I didn't know her last name. Good evening, council members. My name is Shatoya Moss, and I am the Safe and Civil City Director. It is my pleasure to share with you upcoming events for the City of Bloomington's 16th Annual commem Commemoration on National Black History Month. Our 2020 theme is Black and Blooming. The month events will seek to acknowledge and honor up and coming black leaders, visionaries, and change makers who are blazing trails and leaving their mark on our city, state, and country. Whether Bloomington natives or transplant by way of educational journeys and careers, these people have strived to bloom where they are planted and influence the community. The city sponsors four events. However, our calendar has 26 community-wide events these programs along with WFIU Black History Month programs can be found in our annual Black History Month community calendar as well as bloomington.in.gov backslash Black History Month, which I believe all of you receive this lovely calendar. I would like to highlight four events that the City Black History Month Committee has worked so hard preparing. I would also like to recognize those hard workers at this time. Dr. Gloria Howe, the chair, 
Martha Chamberlain, Joy Forrest, Essay Contest Chair, William Hosea, State of the Black Community Chair, Justice Kelly, Arch Chair, Kyra Richardson, Silent Auction Chair, James Sanders, Kickoff Chair, and Deborah Vance. Also, the Community and Family Resources staff, Beverly Counter Anderson, Director, Samuel Miller, our O'Neill Fellow, and Liz Funkhauser, our Cox Civic Scholar. We are extremely thankful for their time and passion they have put into the celebration. We would also like to thank our sponsors, City of Bloomington, Office of the Mayor, Monroe Hospital, City of Bloomington, Office of the Clerk, Boston Scientific, City of Bloomington, Community and Family Resources Department, Ivy Tech Community College, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Bloomington Branch, Indiana University, Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Multicultural Affairs, IU Credit Union, Dr. K. Luke Ease, Isidore Torrey, McQuipa Reese, Indiana University History Department, Southern Star Number 50, Order of the Eastern Star, and Stone City Lodge 54, Prince Hall Masons. Without these generous donors, we would be unable to host these celebratory events. Our first signature event is the Black History Month kickoff. Our kickoff event will take place Thursday, January 30th, so tomorrow, here at City Hall. The event begins with a reception in the atrium at 6 p.m., with the program beginning in council chambers at 7 p.m. The keynote, Dr. Jiro Ahana II, will share personal reflections on his professional path and challenges he has endured along the way as a Nigerian American to defy the odds of blooming. We will also present the Visionary Leader Award to an outstanding community member, the Black and Blooming video, and have performances by a barbershop quartet performed by Tislam Swift, Darian Klontz, Dexter Griffin, and Mar Marcus Peterson. Our second, is, our second event is the third annual State of the Black Community Address. It will take place Tuesday, February 4th in City Hall Council Chambers, beginning with the reception at 5.30 p.m. Following the reception, representatives from the Coalition of Organi Organizations will provide perspectives on black business ownership, black male health, and youth mental health in the black community. This program is hosted by the Bloomington Black Strategic Alliance, and this year during the reception, community members and those attending will have the opportunity to participate in free health screenings and receive mental health information from Monroe Hospital and Bloomington Meadows to increase awareness and promote healthy habits as it relates to the featured topics. Our third event is, a, is special because it involves the youth of our community. Our young scholars and historians will be honored at the 2020 Essay Contest Awards program on Wednesday, February 12th at 6 p.m. at Fairview Elementary. We will recognize all those who submit essays and award first, second, and third place winners from elementary, middle, and high school level. Last year, we received over 100 submissions and we anticipate another great turnout. Students in grade, grades four through 12 are able to enter essays until February 3rd to the bloomington.in.gov backslash BHM. The culminating event for the month is the annual Black History Month Gala. It will be held Saturday, February 29th at Willery Mill. This event will feature dining, dancing, and recognition of the 2020 Living Legend and Outstanding Black Leaders of Tomorrow Award recipients. The reception and silent auction will begin at 6 p.m. with the program at 7 p.m. Tickets may be purchased starting January 30th at the Buskirk Tremley Theater online or by phone. And I also like to mention that all four events will feature 2020 census resources and information. As you may or may not know, the black African American community is one of the historically uncounted groups. We aim to alleviate some fears and correct misinformation while encouraging everyone to be counted. I hope all of you can make at least one or some of these extraordinary events I just mentioned or those listed in the calendar. I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions about uh, Black and Blooming 2020 Black History Month. To my left, to my right. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank we you. appreciate it. Okay, next up, uh, the 2020 Council Sidewalk Committee report. Who is the chair of the Sidewalk Committee? Councilmember Sims. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you all bearing with me. Oh, um, wait, wait. Got a point of Mr. Sherman? Is there an issue? Well, that's true. Thank you. Oh, that's right. I do every year. I would like to uh, submit a disclosure of a conflict of interest. 
I'm uh, administrator attorney for the city council and there is a project <coughs> on a long list uh, of projects that would go by my house. And I use this occasion to, uh, um, to uh, submit a disclosure to you, ask for your acceptance so I can file it in the right places uh, to let you know that that's the case. Now this project has not been um, seriously discussed for funding, but it's on the list. And since it uh, would uh, lead to a financial benefit for me, I use this occasion to request that you uh, accept this disclosure. Thank you. Is there a motion to accept the disclosure? We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Thank you. The closure is accepted. We thank you. Councilmember Sims, if you'll begin with the sidewalk report. Thank you very much. Um, the sidewalk committee is a council committee whose purpose is to recommend allocation funds to aid in building sidewalks to improve connectivity throughout this city. Um, last year's committee, um, before we had elections and reorganization in January, were comprised of uh, myself, Dave Rollo, Dorothy Granger, and Chris Sturbaum. Um, but since we reorganized in January, new members on this committee, council members, are Council Member Kate Rosenbarger and Council Member Ron Smith. So uh, just kind of wanted to clear that up before we got started. Many other committee members and staff that assisted this progress, in addition to Council Member Rollo and myself, was Council Members Granger, Sturbaum, Mr. Stephen Lucas, Dan Sherman, Nicole Bowden, Sophia McDowell, Neil Copper, Beth Rosenbarger, Roy Atten, Jane Flagg, Bob Wolfert, and Steve Cotter. Now these folks comprise of the Parks and Recreation Department, Housing and Neighborhood Development Department, Planning and Transportation Department, the Council Clerk's Office, and our Council staff. I will note that the money that's available this year is $324,000, um, and then that was an increase of $6,000 from the previous year. This money comes from an Alternative Transportation Fund, or ATF, and the purpose is to reduce the community's dependence upon the automobile. If we can display the amount, or I'm sorry, the history of funding slide. Now this table gives you a sense of how the money has increased over the years. Note that unused funding reverts back to the ATF, the Alternative Transportation Fund, and would hopefully be available for other sidewalk projects. Now we'll look at the criteria and objective measures slide. These objective measures have been developed and refined over the years by planning and transportation staff with input from committee members. They are used to assist with prioritizing these projects. Next, we'll display the prior project prioritization list. Now, please note that this table is probably too small for you to read, um, but that's okay. The point we're trying to illustrate here is that there are over 60 projects on this list. Note that the projects are ranked by the objective criteria you just displayed, which includes things like safety, walk score, linkages, and cost and feasibility. However, the number one ranked project doesn't automatically get funded because funding, availability, and phasing also plays roles in this decision. The committee also has multiple projects going on at once. So in any given year, the committee might fund construction of all or a portion of some projects and might fund design for a few new projects. Projects are added to the list primarily by request of members of the public which they can do by submitting a U report on the city website or by contacting the council office. Now the recommended funding for 2020 are the following. We'll have six projects this year. The previously funded sidewalk projects and we expect construction in 2020 is the Maxwell Street from Miller Drive to north of Short Street which is on, on the west side of that street. That's Maxwell Street from Miller Drive to, short of nor to north of Short Street. I'll get that straight. And that's on the west side of the walkway. 
The next project is 14th Street from Madison Street to Woodburn Avenue on the north side of the street. This project was submitted for CDBG funding and whether it receives any money from that source might impact the, uh, the amount of funding that comes to or comes from the sidewalk committee. It might also impact the construction schedule depending on if or when the CDBG funding becomes available. Now, if, if you can see on the map, um, I'm really excited about this particular project um, because some of the, the priorities or our goals of the sidewalk committee is to put sidewalks where there are none located and there are no safe sidewalks along this area. Um, and it's one of the areas that we hear often in um, city council meetings from uh, the public about having the need for sidewalks in that particular area. Now we have moving on to new sidewalk projects and design which is expected in the year 2020 this year. It is on Walnut Street from Winslow Road to Ridgeview Drive which is on the east side of the road. This is recommended due to the high density, the difficulty in crossing from one side of the street to the other and increases in traffic. So it's on Walnut Street, starts on Winslow and goes north to Ridgeview Drive. North, I'm sorry. No, it is north. Yes. Yeah. No, south. South to Ridgeview Drive. Okay, I'll turn my chair around and I'll be correct. Um, to south, thank you very much. The next area is Adam Street from Kirkwood to Fountain Drive on the west side of the road. This was recommended by staff as a result of a public meeting held by the planning and transportation staff about the Adam Street sidewalk connection. This would fill in gaps on the west side of the street. Um, something else I would mention, the sidewalk committee has its funding amount and one of the ways that we try to be more efficient and stretch out those dollars and get a bigger bang for the buck is to work in cohort with other city departments such as utilities um, if they're doing curb work or, or something like that and we can kind of team up and, and get a bigger bang for our buck. Um, same thing with planning and transportation, something in some cases with um, hand with some of those projects. We also have two more traffic calming projects um, that's on this year's list. This is on West Graham, Graham Drive and it's in the Broadview neighborhood. This project would install permanent traffic calming devices in the Broadview neighborhood. This is recommended due to the previous use of temporary traffic calming devices in the area. This project is dependent on the neighborhood traffic safety program process that is currently taking place where the neighborhood will vote on the project. The outcome of that vote will impact whether this moves forward. The second traffic calming project is east on East Moores Pike and South Smith Road at that intersection. This is a crosswalk slash intersection improvements and recommended because the sidewalks at the intersection do not align, making it difficult to cross. The project would help permit safe crossing for pedestrians at this intersection. Now we'll move on to the funding grid. Please note that when possible, the sidewalk committee tries to work in concert with other departments um, like utilities, parks and rec and others to coordinate projects um, as I just mentioned. Also try, we also try to stretch dollars by combining funding sources like uh, applying for CDBG funds, community development block grant funds. The committee has a very difficult job because there are so many projects worthy of funding but only so much money is available and sidewalks are expensive to build. Requests for new sidewalks are always welcome and can be submitted via you report or to our city council office. I would now like to offer any other council members that participated or any who have any comments, but if council member Rollo has any input, um, since he worked really hard on this before I took over his chair. Thank you, council member Sims. I uh, I think you did an excellent summation, and um, I think it's it's important uh, just again to emphasize that the, the matrix of prioritization 
with that 60 some list of, of projects is meant to be a tool and it's, it really requires a more refinement in terms of review by the, the participants. And so um, we look for things that Council Member Sim alluded to, for instance, leveraging funds from other groups like CDBG in the case of the 14th Street sidewalk. Uh, and then there are other priorities that we anticipate, for instance, on Miller Drive. Um, the council, a couple of, I think it was last year or the two years ago, approved a very high density Bloomington co-housing project at the very end, the south end of Miller Drive, opening of Short Street. And so there's going to be a lot more traffic in the neighborhood. So it was a commitment to the neighbors there that we would address that situation. Um, so those just give an, an idea of why the matrix doesn't necessarily always follow in terms of a strict prioritization, in case council members were curious about that. Um, otherwise, I don't have anything else to, to add, except that we're always lacking more funds. So the list will go on faster than we seem to be able to uh, address it. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, President. gentlemen. Uh, with that, we'll go to questions from my colleagues on the Sidewalk Committee report. Anyone have a question? Uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yeah, I wanted to just follow up on the traffic calming in the Broadview neighborhood on Graham Drive. So um, it's my understanding that the, the allocation of $60,000 will be used, but it, the, the neighborhood is going to help decide how it's going to be used. Is that correct? Um, I'll pass that over to um, Mr. Lucas, our council office. He, he can explain it a little bit better than I can. Okay. So, the transportation is going through the neighborhood traffic uh, and safety program process right now, which entails the neighborhood voting, I believe, on whether the, the uh, traffic calming devices are installed at all. Currently, there are some temporary devices uh, that were previously funded, at least in part, by the sidewalk committee. And so this project, if it's approved by the, the neighbors, would uh, expand on the devices already there. I don't believe they take those up, but they would install additional devices. Um, but the outcome of that vote, I, I believe, would impact whether this project moves forward. Uh, if they were to vote, it, vote no, then that $60,000 might be available for uh, making up shortages in other projects, which has happened in the past uh, or might be uh, available to the committee to recommend a, a, for an allocation to a different project. So it might come, uh, if the Broadview neighborhood votes no, then the committee might come back together and decide what to do with the money? It's, it's possible. We, the committee also has an overage policy that gives some leeway to staff to shift funds from one project to another. So. Um, we may need to work with uh, planning to see uh, as we move forward how accurate their estimates were. A lot of these construction uh, prices are, are estimates. And so the committee has adopted a policy to allow a certain portion of funding. If there's a, uh, a sidewalk that comes in cheaper than expected, um, they may be able to use that funding to make up shortages elsewhere. So it's possible that depending on if there's a, a large amount still available for the committee, that this comes back to the council. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for the sidewalk committee? I do have one. Uh, I wonder if uh, members of the committee have ever uh, thought about asking about uh, the possibility of TIF funding to fund sidewalks. What say ye? Um, it is my understanding with our own funding and then with uh, applying for CDBG <laughs> funding, um, I am not aware of TIF funding use. Uh, Council Member Rollo, do you? I'm trying to recall if there's restrictions in terms of I mean, it's whether they need to be in the TIF capital. district. So, downtown TIF, and so that was part of the discussion. Uh, well, I guess the question was more: um, Is there a reason that we don't solicit uh, more funding through TIF dollars to build sidewalks, at least in the area affected by the TIF? Well, if you're asking me, my position is um, many of our resources are being stretched and have other more long-term plans. 
Um, so I think that is a funding option, but it's not the primary option. No. Um, so I think it is available, and as I understand it, um, we could utilize it, um, but that hasn't been the plan on my tenure last three years that I know about. Mr. Rollo? Good question. Any thoughts? Uh, that's a good question. I think I, I do recall discussing TIF funding once, but I think most of the sidewalk projects fall outside the TIF district, and it's right. not as though we're not looking for other funds. In fact, we've used Greenway funds, we've used MPO, we've used CDBG <coughs> to tag team utilities. So we are always looking for ways in which we can leverage more. Um, and, uh, but that would be good to do a review specific to, for TIF and those that apply. Yeah. Councilmember scamble um, Yes, thank you. Uh, TIF Again, I'm a, finishing up as a member of the Redevelopment Commission uh, for the City of Bloomington, and the regulations require any improvements to be in a TIF or serving a TIF is actually the language in statute right now. And we have actually used TIF funds a couple times in my recollection. I'd have to go back and check my notes for sure, but um, when sidewalks occurred in combination with a larger project, so for example, on West 17th, uh, when the roundabout went in near Tri, near Tri North, um, that also included some sideways and pedestrian walkways. So TIF was part of that larger project too. So I think I've seen that a couple times. Oh, that's good to know. Very interesting. Any other questions for sidewalk? Seeing none, we will go do to we need a motion to adopt the report. Oh, what do we do. I'm sorry. We need a motion to adopt. Is that the, the appropriate report? motion, yeah. you want yes. to do a motion, Mr. Sherman? Recommendations. So rather than simply accept it, you want to make a motion to approve. Motion. I move that we approve the report. Second. We have a motion and a second. We have a roll, uh, roll call vote, please. Can we have a roll call vote on the sidewalk board? More time. Councilmember Rallo? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Bowling? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Okay. That's 9 0. Uh, approval of the report. Thank you, Councilmember Sims, Councilmember Rallo, everyone who helped. We now will move to legis oh, so sorry, to reports from the public. So any member of the public would like to speak tonight. On items not on the agenda, please come to the podium. You'll have five minutes. State your name. Good evening. I'm Mary Morgan. I'm a Director of Advocacy and Public Policy for the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, and I am delighted to speak to you tonight on a topic unrelated to the UDO. Um, I'm here to talk to you about public transit, and specifically to ask you to change Chapter 2.76 of the Bloomington Municipal Code to allow Bloomington Transit to provide service outside the city limits. This is a small but necessary step to make our community's public transit system even better for city residents, for city residents, including employers and people who are working hard to improve their lives. The current code states that the boundaries of the Bloomington Public Transportation Corporation must be coterminous with the boundaries of the city. It's my understanding that Bloomington is the only city in um, Indiana with this constraint. Lifting this re restriction by itself does nothing in the short term. It does not mean that Bloomington Transit will start sending out buses um, outside the city limits, but it does provide flexibility for BT to adjust its routes if the staff and board determine that doing so would be financially viable. As you know, Bloomington um, Transit is undergoing a route optimization process. Consultants for this project do recommend that BT provide service out to Ivy Tech and Cook Group, which are located beyond the city limits. Um, last week I attended a BT board meeting and uh, members there discussed this issue, uh, the specific issue. Several of them seem reluctant to even explore the possibility of making that route change until they knew that the council would be willing to change the city code. Um, their thinking is that if the city is unwilling to do that, specifically the city council, then the work to see if such a route is financially viable isn't even worth their effort to explore. 
Um, most of us don't constrain our lives to city limits, even if we live here. Um, many city residents do need to attend Ivy Tech or work at Cook Group or shop on the western edge of our community. Um, I would also point out that this is an equity issue. Uh, late last year, the Bloomington Affordable Living Committee um, issued a report called Working Hard, Falling Behind, and it addresses specifically the need for a robust public transit system. It includes this comment, I think it's really um, relevant from a local nonprofit, and I'm quoting now. In many cases, lack of transportation or funds for public transportation become one of the greatest barriers to our clients gaining employment and attending our services. Affordable, reliable, and accessible public transportation is critical to many in our community as they work to sustain employment, fulfill basic needs, gain access to social services, and engage in our community." End quote. So obviously there are many challenges to expand transit, including financial resources and political tensions between the city and the county. Looking at how to improve public transit in other ways, even within the city, um, should also be a goal for our community. There's really hard work to be done. But changing the city ordinance, it's an easy step. And it's a step that I hope you'll consider and implement soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daniel Bingham. Uh, I wanted to comment on um, Director Vic Kelson's presentation about the proposed anaerobic digester that he made on the 15th of January to the council. Um, I've been a little frustrated with this task force from the beginning because I think we're asking the wrong question with it. And I think Mr. Kelson's presentation showed that when you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong information. Um, we're asking, should we build an anaerobic digester? And that presentation, it seemed maybe that should, it, we're not even asking should maybe, but can we? Which of course the answer is, yeah, we can. Um, but what we should really be asking is, what's the most economic and carbon efficient way to handle our wastewater? There was a study done in Germany that looked at nine aerobic composting facilities and nine anaerobic digestion facilities to see what their carbon emissions were. They found that they were equivalent, exactly equivalent. The composting, the aerobic composting facilities had about emissions of about 53 kilograms of CO2 equivalent, uh, a range that went from 53 kilograms to 411 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per megagram of bio waste. The digesters had anywhere from 50 kilograms to 457 kilograms per megagram of bio waste. It was like a wash. Um, the number given for building the anaerobic digester in, in Bloomington was 30 million to 35 million dollars. We don't have numbers. I wasn't able to find numbers in the time I had researching this this afternoon. Um, for what it would cost to build an aerobic composting facility. But given that it's a much lower tech venture than a digester, it's a good bet it'd be a lot lower. Um, things that were left out of Kelson's report, uh, the, di the digestate that results from an anaerobic digester cannot be used as is. It has to be composted. Most digesters do it in wind tunnels alongside them. Some do it in enclosed facilities, and those actually have the lowest emissions because when you compost that digestate, it actually carries a lot of the methane with it out of the digestion process, which gets released when you compost it, which is one of the biggest contributors to those digesters' greenhouse gas emissions. Um, any concern about contamination of the input, the digester doesn't clean that out. You have the same concerns about contamination with aerobic composting and anaerobic composting. So if we were worried about, for example, PCBs in our effluent that would make that compost unusable, we have the same problems with a digester or with aerobic composting. It, they're pretty much equivalent. So we should, at the very least in this discussion, we need to be asking, what's the most economically efficient and carbon efficient way of handling our wastewater? And we need to be getting numbers for anaerobic composting. Um, the real question we should be asking, though, is even one step up from that, which is, what's the best use of our money? What is the greatest impact from the dollars we spend in terms of cutting carbon emissions and helping people? Um, if we were to take that $30 million that is proposed to be spent on this plant and spend it instead just on solar, purely on solar, then we could build 10 megawatts of solar. The current price of solar is about a dollar or $3 a watt. So $30 million divided by $3, you get 10 megawatts. Um, 
that would displace about 88,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. Granted, that's a back of the envelope com calculation, so somebody should check that. But based on the numbers I just ran, that would get us 88,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent displacement. At best, if the digester is able to displace all of our wastewater emissions and from the displace the electricity for 350 kilowatts, I think was the number Kelson gave, um, we're looking at displacing 18,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent a year for that digester. So spending that money on solar, we get four times the carbon displacement as we would building this digester. Even if you say that there's this chance this plant, say that this plant will live 50 years and the average life of a solar panel is 25 to 30, you still get twice the carbon displacement over the lifetime of those solar panels than we would from this digester. So I think we re need to seriously ask, are we asking the right questions with this? And is this digester the right thing to be building, the right place to put our money? And I really don't think it is. Um, I also want to point out that in his presentation, Kelson pointed out that the, debt, the, the cost of covering the debt service from building the digester would be equivalent to an 8% rate increase, increase. That's basically a regressive tax that's going to hit low-income families hardest for no benefit to them other than a cost a cut in carbon, potentially, but no other benefit. It's important to keep that in mind. Thank you. That's your time. Thank you very much. Any other public comment? Seeing none, we will go to legislation for second reading and resolutions. Mr. Chair, I move that resolution 2001 be introduced and read by title and synopsis only. Second. Motion and second. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Will the clerk please read? Resolution 2001 to establish standing committees and abolish other certain committees of the Common Council. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution is sponsored by Council Member Volan and proposes the creation of various council standing committees along with the dissolution of council interviewing committees. You do not have a committee recommendation. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I move that resolution 2001 be adopted. Thank you, and with that, I'm going to pass the gavel to Councilmember Sims, the Vice President, so that I may present. Uh, so uh, since this was introduced on the 8th, um, we've had a couple of, of meetings with many concerned individuals, mostly staff, on January 10th. Um, they summarized their concerns in, um, uh, particularly in a memo sent by uh, Deputy Mayor Renison. Um, I have uh, authored uh, three memos, one in response to the memo handed out by uh, Deputy Mayor Renison, written by Philippa Guthrie on January 8th, the second uh, response to Terry Porter, uh, and the third is a response to all the other questions compiled by um, department heads, uh, uh, from department heads by Mr. Renison. Um, uh, and I feel that those, which are, those memos which are in your packet uh, do a pretty thorough job of unpacking any misunderstandings about the intent of this resolution. Um, uh, I will be, nevertheless, because staff still have some concerns and because the schedule doesn't really allow anything sooner, I'm going to be asking tonight for a postponement of this to the meeting of February 19th. Uh, February 5th is too soon for uh, department heads to uh, get, on, get this on their calendar. February 12th, we expect to have not one but two significant issues before the council, the Trinitas PUD and uh, the discussion of towing. And so the 19th uh, is a good date um, for uh, this to come back and that'll give us time to schedule, uh, give the department it's enough time to plan to schedule uh, another meeting. With that, I would like to, and I'm gonna give myself 10 minutes here, um, I don't, won't need that much time, but I just want to go over the highlights of what is in your packet, which is an amendment by substitution, which makes a number of revisions based on feedback from council members and staff. Uh, in no particular order, uh, the, uh, I, Mr. Sherman, should I introduce the amendment by substitution? Uh, is yes, it necessary to, now to or should it can it wait? Subject of discussion, and then if okay. you are intending to postpone, um, Essentially, okay. you're postponing that 
discussion to a later date. I will move uh, this amendment one by substitution to resolution 2001. Second. Thank you. So what is in this amendment by substitution? Um, again, in no particular order, one thing it does is delays implementation of the abolition of nominating committees until September 1. Uh, the logic here is that uh, we don't quite have a policy yet for how, or no practice yet on how to manage four member uh, committees for this particular task. Um, and so it's, uh, and we have an immediate need to uh, name um, uh, individuals to boards and commissions. So I find this to be a reasonable accommodation uh, that uh, will allow us to develop uh, policy. Um, there are now descriptions of each committee that explain in one sentence or two uh, what the uh, purview of that committee is. Uh, even as those descriptions have been added, there's been some redundant language in each description uh, where that has been stricken. Um, a phrase has been added to the line about how um, each uh, committee, uh, where is it? shall be responsible for oversight of the following boards, commissions, and city departments. This term oversight was a very controversial one. Um, department heads interpreted it to mean that um, uh, the council wanted to, uh, to be in charge of the executive branch departments, which was not the case. I had to explain that oversight uh, does mean to supervise, but it also means to inspect or examine and the ability to inspect or examine the workings of the city is essential to our jobs as council members. That's all I've ever intended whenever I've used the word oversight. Um, the word investigate is used in city code. Uh, that is a, also a necessary function of uh, ability of council, but um, I use the term investigate under um, innocuous circumstances to, to mean inspect or examine as well. So uh, in addition to leaving that word in, I've added the phrase to clarify that uh, each committee is not only responsible for oversight of, but acts as a liaison to the various departments or divisions uh, that the committee's purview uh, encompasses. So this is to emphasize the idea that um, council committees do not replace, they're not boards and commissions, they're not a new layer of, um, uh, they, they're not an extra layer of bureaucracy. They're replacing uh, the committee at the whole. Um, and that uh, uh, departments should see the four member committee that is their liaison as uh, an aid to accessing the council's process. Um, one change in the administration committee is that it now subsumes the function of the recently formed rules committee uh, which had taken up business last fall, but did not complete its work. Uh, there are a couple of changes to whereas clauses. And uh, finally, there are a couple of moves. Uh, oversight of the Arts Commission has moved from um, uh, to the Community Affairs uh, Committee and oversight of the Human Rights Commission and the Farmers Market Advisory Committee to the Sustainability, Climate Action and Resilience Committee. Um, and again, there's also been a distinction between oversight of a commission or board and appointments to it. The council does not have appointments to every board and commission, but for those that it does, those are separately noted under each committee. Uh, that's the entirety of the changes, as far as I can recall, uh, to uh, in this amendment by substitution. Uh, and with that, again, I want to ask that the motion here, in order to be able to fully accommodate staff's understanding of this uh, new uh, system uh, that we postpone after discussion to the meeting of February the 19th. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Sims. Okay, do we have any questions from council? Mr. Veldman? I have one. Um, just a matter of procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, everything you just said, do we have copies of that? Or, or this, uh, uh, Mr. Sherman, have they been distributed, the copies? I know they've been emailed. Okay, I haven't checked email yet. But Are they do, in the packet? 
Yeah, they're, they're in, in the, the they're in this material. They did not go out on last right. Friday. Okay, so it's not in um, this package. Right, and this is not yet another reason to, to for people to take time. I don't think the changes okay. are particularly significant, but you know, it it uh, we're served by having the, gotcha. uh, having this postponed. Okay, thank you, <clears throat> Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, I'm I'm a little concerned by the term oversight um, since. Uh, when we had our work session uh, with staff, there was obviously a different interpretation of what oversight means uh, in relation to standing committees and their oversight of certain departments and uh, boards. Um, would you consider using a different term or including within the resolution what you mean by oversight? I'd be happy to do the latter. Again, I've explained uh, tonight and previously in the memo in, in public uh, at the work session where we had this uh, discussion with department heads. <clears throat> but I mean, this is a, a, a term defined in the dictionary. I went to Merriam-Webster for it. And there are two meanings of this sense of the word oversight. Again, uh, <clears throat> supervision, which is literally the Latin version of the word oversight. To supervise is to oversee. So they have the same meaning um, in theory, but uh, in the dictionary, under the term supervise, to oversee means to inspect or examine. And that has always been the sense in which I've meant it. But in order to clarify, I'm very happy to uh, make that definition, perhaps as a whereas clause, that would say whereas the dictionary uh, defines oversight in this way. If that. Um, I mean, it seems like that will help clarify. It's right here. Yeah, we already have a copy, I think. <laughs> She's just passing it out. Don't, okay. don't let well, we that stop It's you. in the packet. Um, but it, so at any rate, that's my answer is, yes, I'd be happy to add a whereas clause that would clarify the definition of the term oversight. Thank you. Any further questions from council? Seeing none, um, we'll now move to the public. Thank you. Hi, Peter Dorfman. I, I had an opportunity last night at uh, Council Member Rosenberger's uh, um, constituent meeting to have some reflections on uh, this proposal. Uh, I have some concerns, uh, some procedural concerns. I, I just sat through the Land Use Committee's uh, review of a particular PUD, and it was a very efficient process, but it was a very small issue. It was a very confined issue. Not that much would needed to be defined tonight. So it went very well. Um, I am concerned that the committees will be asked to hear issues that are much bigger, much more complex, and potentially much more controversial. That. Uh, will not lend themselves to efficient discussion uh, during confined periods that uh, will be given to uh, standing committee discussions. Um, I have uh, the understanding that um, this council has the option to decide whether or not to assign a particular issue to a standing committee or alternatively to hear it through the uh, committee of the whole. And I would like some clarification on, on that process, how that decision will be made. Uh, I, I think it, it's important to lay that out. Um, and I, I, I think that needs to be done with an eye toward allowing the public to know how that decision will be made. Um, we've just gone through a contentious year. And I can see the potential for uh, issues coming before the council to take on that same level of contentiousness. I, it would be important, I think, to me for the public to have the opportunity to see how the decision about whether to have the Committee of the Hold hear it or a uh, Standing Committee hear it gets made. It would be ideal, in my mind, uh, if that decision were made in front of the public, potentially with the public's uh, option of commenting on that decision. Um, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Daniel Bingham. Um, I just wanted to respond to the question of oversight. 
and to urge the count. I've said before that I'm very much supportive of the committee proposal, and I remain very supportive of the committee proposal. I think you have to break down work of this level in two chunks in order to handle it efficiently and effectively. Um, on the question of oversight, I would really urge the council not to balk at pushback on the basis of oversight or accountability or investigation. Um, there's a reason we have multiple branches of government at all levels. Those branches are meant to hold each other in check, to hold each other accountable, to provide oversight of each other. And part of the council's duty is to provide oversight broadly of the executive branch. And I think breaking that work into committees so that it can be done, can be done more effectively makes sense. And it makes sense that the executive branch would not necessarily be thrilled about that and might push back at it because nobody loves having being held accountable. It's not fun for any of us. But it's really important. It's really important that we hold ourselves accountable, and it's really important that we hold each other accountable. And I think this proposal will strengthen the council's ability to hold the executive branch accountable, and that can only benefit the public. Thank you. Thank you. Any more public comments? Seeing none, we'll go back to questions. Pardon? Second questions. Second questions. We're not moving to comments. Second questions of council. Say, council member Piedmont Smith. Well, I will just uh, redirect the question um, asked by Mr. Dorfman to the sponsor, Mr. Bowling. I was hoping for that opportunity. Uh, yeah, so uh, Mr. Dorfman raises some good points. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see that he thought that the, uh, the committee meeting tonight went uh, smoothly. I like to think that uh, that's part of the benefit of the process, that um, this was a controversial project when it came forward, and um, the, the, through the two meeting process, uh, issues have been resolved to the point where uh, both meetings ended less than two hours. In fact, they were uh, 50 minutes shorter than the four hours allocated. Uh, but for more controversial issues, it's a very good question. At first, it, it's hard to tell when an issue is going to be controversial sometimes, um, sometimes uh, opposition comes out of the woodwork, but it can be anticipated sometimes. I would say this. Um, uh, he mentioned uh, what we went through last year. That was the UDO. That was the first time in 13 years that we had revised an entire title of city code. Uh, I would not have recommended that the UDO go to the Land Use Committee. It was too big. We spent three months as a whole council dealing with it. There were dozens and dozens of amendments. Um, that's an example of something that wouldn't even go to committee the whole, we'd set up a special, I mean, it's so big, we would set up a special process for considering it. We've done that before, we can do that again. Um, I will point out that the number one committee in second class cities in the state is a finance committee. 18 or 19 cities consider their budget in committee. Now, some of those committees involve the majority of members, but most of them are committees like what I'm proposing. I am not proposing that there be a finance committee or that we handle the budget any way that we have. The budget would continue to be uh, managed by committee of the whole. It's an example of an exception to the rule. Um, I think that when uh, a, an extremely controversial issue comes forward, we should uh, evaluate whether or not it should be held by the committee of the whole. Um, I will uh, continue to urge for the sake of uh, second and fourth Wednesday nights that we try whenever possible to, to send everything to one of the standing committees, but there is a public choice in the matter. Um, while uh, I as president uh, can uh, and, and will recommend, you know, ask for recommendations to uh, forward something to a particular committee, if that vote fails, then a member may move to, uh, if the first vote fails, a member may move to recommend that it be assigned to a different committee, or uh, on the second and after, they can move to assign the issue to the committee of the whole. So that is a public decision that can be made by majority of council members. The default, though, as code currently says, should be to make an effort to refer to a standing committee. So I think that that's, I mean, I also think that for the most part, it's going to be self-evident which committee any given issue should go to if it's a matter of dispute. We will pick one, not two committees. 
it has to go to one or the other. The goal of the committee is simply to triage. So, um, you know, for example, we have the question of predatory towing. Uh, I am going to propose on February 5th, since uh, we're not going to adopt and create committees tonight, uh, that we create an ad hoc committee of four uh, just for the sake of that uh, ordinance while we continue to deliberate on committees. Because it was clear to everyone in the room that night that no one was opposed to an ordinance to regulate towing and to reduce predatory towing, but that uh, there was a great deal of, of uh, knowledge that everyone in the room didn't share, and that, uh, especially from the towing companies who came and said very interesting things. So with that, uh, I would say that, um, you know, that, that will also allow us to have, um, uh, to not have a committee to hold in a land use committee meeting on February the 12th. But uh, with that, I feel like, uh, um, you know, the, the concerns about how the committees will be used are relatively straightforward and that uh, we will become accustomed to it soon enough and it will become obvious what uh, legislation will go where. And when it isn't, we'll learn. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I don't feel like the council member from District 6 has answered my question. Who will decide which committee legislation is to be referred to? Okay. Like the, the, the first thing we will do is try to refer to a standing committee, but who decides which standing committee? So uh, the council leadership has a meeting every Tuesday at four with uh, the administration where we just plan the schedule. We look ahead several weeks, several months to anticipate what legislation is coming and when to schedule things. At that point, um, you know, before legislation has been first read, uh, we have to start making decisions about who is the most logical um, uh, committee to hear a given item. Again, I believe that for the most part it will be obvious if you have a utilities uh, issue, it should go to the utilities committee. Um, I, I uh, think that the president should make the initial decision when the parliamentarian makes the motion as to what committee to refer to. Uh, if that is defeated, then another member can make another suggestion, either to, to refer to another committee or to refer to committee of the whole. But somebody needs to make the initial decision <coughs> that should reside with the president and the vice president at the leadership meeting. I hope that answers the council member from District 5's question. Okay. Council member Rosenberger. To the sponsor, I just wanted to ask if you could clarify for Mr. Dorfman if the public would be involved in the process at all of deciding if this would go to standing committee or not, and if this is happening in a public meeting. The uh, vote to refer to committee is a public vote. Uh, we've just been so accustomed to automatically referring to Committee of the Whole that we haven't thought about it. Uh, but it's a necessary part of the process. Someone has to make the announcement of what committee is going to hear it. Uh, so that will simply be part of the agenda. Um, as far as, I'm not sure I answered the whole question. You, uh, I asked, yes, first, if the public would be, would see yeah. that, and I, I do know that happens at first hearing, and then if they would have time to comment on it. That's the one thing I don't, I haven't thought about. Mr. Sherman, if uh, uh, on a motion to refer, is that, uh, I mean, that would be debatable. Would it uh, take comment? I'm not, not currently. Sure. Okay. So it would take an exception to Roberts since it's not in code to, we'd have to suspend the rules. Yeah. What? In order to do that, we may have to either, uh, if it's not in the resolution, we'd have to have a motion that establishes that procedure. Right now, um, I, was, I was talking to some people before the meeting, there is no debate upon introduction. Um, you do refer at that point. Uh, in the past, we have not opened up referral to public comment. Uh, you could do that, um, but currently we don't. Okay, so uh, this is a matter of practice and policy. 
um, if uh, uh, whenever uh, we are, there is a, an absence of uh, direction in city code or in Roberts on procedure, um, the rules can be suspended by a two-thirds vote of council. So, um, but uh, absent a change in our rules, at least that mechanism is available to us. Um, I'm not averse to, once again, changing the resolution if that will have, um, if that will be effective in establishing that policy. Will that be effective, Mr. Sherman, to, to put it in the resolution? Okay. So again, I'm not averse to it if that's uh, 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 what the It would work the in the interim. Like. Pardon me? It would work in the interim. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, any further council questions? No. Council comment. Now moving to council comment. Does any of my colleagues have any comments? Council member Piedmont Smith. Yeah, um, I appreciate Councilmember Volan postponing uh, voluntarily this piece of uh, legislation. I think it is important to um, understand all the concerns of staff and work out some of the details of how this system would be implemented. So um, I'm glad we will have a few more weeks to do that. Uh, in general, I'm favorable to the system. I find that um, it is uh, difficult for me as a as a council member to track and delve into uh, pieces of legislation that um, uh, have s such wide variation of topic. And so I think this would allow um, members of the standing committees to both be more diligent in our um, oversight uh, of uh, the executive branch and also to specialize somewhat and become more expert in certain areas. Uh, so um, with that, I'm, I'm glad to have a little more time, and I think it would uh, certainly work best um, if we have the um, cooperation and coordination with staff and with our fellow council members. So hopefully we can, we can work towards that in the next few weeks. Thank you. Further council comments? Council Member Scambolari. Yes, thank you. Um, my thanks as well for buying us another week or so, too. I, know, I just want to recall that uh, one of the very first reasons we put forward for even considering committees is to delve into legislation and make sure it is the best legislation and in its best form. Um, so thank you for doing that with this piece of legislation. I think uh, uh, some additional time with staff will help us make refinements that will be helpful. So thanks. Thank you. Any further comments from my colleagues? Um, before I move further, um, and maybe the parliamentarian can help me, this will be brought back on February the 19th. If it's if it if, if we if the motion passes, and that'll be like normal. So there'll be comment time and more question time and all of that. So um, so speaking tonight will probably just prolong things. I was just just thinking out loud. Okay, do we have any more council comments? Yes, council member Flaherty. I'll keep it brief. I have spoken before on uh, my, why I think favorably about this uh, proposal. Uh, earlier today I was at the um, Innovation Showcase, the first annual, as the mayor uh, pointed out, and that was enjoyable, and I got to see um, Dave Takid, our director of innovation, speak about innovation. Uh, she made the point that most innovations are process improvements. Um, like 80 percent or something, and she spoke specifically um, that often new people coming in saying, why are we doing things like this, are a way to help identify those, and I think it fits well with uh, the comments made in the packet in, in Councilmember um, Volan's comments that council in, needs to rethink every aspect of the way it does business. We should be revisiting process and, and looking at what's working well and what, what isn't working well. Um, and I would think the administration with its, uh, you know, strong favor of innovation would be amenable to this as well. A lot of the comments from staff, I think, uh, really speak to frustrations with council generally, and I think this and other changes are, are ways we can work to be more efficient for the public, more accessible, and more um, considerate of, of, of city staff's time and scheduling. So that's all. Thank you. Oops, thank you. Further comments? 
Okay. Uh, do we I want to make the motion to put? I want to make a comment. I'm waiting to go last on the sponsor. I'll probably be last, but Council Member okay. Volden. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just want to say briefly that um, I don't know when it was that Committee of the Whole became the standard for the city. We haven't yet figured out exactly when um, that system was implemented, but I want to call your attention to this document recently discovered. This is Ordinance 6817, passed January 22nd, signed by John, Mayor John H. Hooker, Jr., uh, January 22, 1968. Uh, it's an ordinance to amend uh, Section 61 of Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Committees of Chapter 2 of the Code, which was passed in 1957. Uh, and they amended it to read as follows. To facilitate the transaction of business, the following standing committees are established to which matters and questions before the Council may, from time to time, be referred for investigation and report. And those committees were finance, utilities and properties, public safety and traffic planning, planning, zoning and land use, university and governmental affairs, community research and development, civic affairs and rules, ordinances and resolutions. It's very interesting to take a look at how uh, the council thought about breaking up the work back in 1968. I'll point out that this was the first month of a new term of council. Uh, and they adopted this, uh, this was already ordinance number 17 of the year 1968. They did a lot of work in the first few weeks. I don't know how they got that far, but uh, they were still uh, in the first month they were organizing. I'm following in this tradition with this resolution, even though it's not an ordinance, it's just triggering code that was passed by ordinance. Um, but uh, that's why I introduced this in the first month of the new term, because we're not just organizing for the year, we're organizing for a new council. And I think that uh, this document, I'm eager to see some uh, similar ordinances from 1972, 1976, 1980. I think that code changed in 1979. That might have been where it changed. But uh, let's just say that this is uh, an example from our own history of how the council once divided into committees, many of which are similar, if not identical, to uh, the ones that I've proposed in Resolution 2001. So I hope that when we come back on the 19th, everyone's concerns about the, uh, well, again, I'll call it the innocuousness of this idea uh, of the breaking down of the council's work um, in this way is, uh, is manifest. I, I hope that on the 19th, you will support this, or this resolution. Thank you. Further comments from in council members? I move to table this resolution until February 19th. Is it to postpone? To postpone, not table. No, it's to table. Postpone until a certain day is what you're doing. You move to postpone, table is killing it. Okay. I thought I had read my Robert's rules that we need to table it, but. I would also be willing to postpone until February 19th. <laughs> been, been properly moved and second. Is this a roll call? No, he will call vote, yeah. Roll call. Will the clerk please read? Councilmember Scambaluri? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Sims? I know. I know. I know. No, thank you. <laughs> yes. Volan? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? <coughs> yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Okay, and that is. Nine, Nine zero. zero. Thank um, you. Passed to postpone until February 19th. Okay, do I give you back the gavel? Yes, you do, sir. All right. I know, but I like it now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sims. Uh, we now go to matters of council schedule, Mr. Sherman. Yes, a few items. Um, a reminder that we have a council work session, not this Friday, but the Friday after this one. So that's the 7th. I'll know more about what's on that agenda uh, next week and we'll relay that to you. 
Uh, I do have a question. Uh, we did have a brief uh, comment from the president about the predatory towing ordinance. You know that's coming back for second, that's coming to second reading next week. And uh, based upon your discussion at, at the Committee of the Whole and what I'm hearing tonight, uh, uh, that won't be the end of the matter. So what do you want to have happen next week? What should staff do to prepare for that meeting? Will, it, will the public be uh, invited to come and, and address the issue, or is this matter going to be simply uh, uh, set on another schedule? So if you could talk about that briefly, we'll know how to proceed. You're talking about the PUD we talked about tonight in Land Use Committee, or the towing? towing. The towing. This is towing, yes. Okay, so um, again, my uh, idea that I was going to propose on February 5th is to create an ad hoc committee that would have uh, uh, been the same four who would have served on the appropriate committee under the standing committee regime uh, had they been adopted tonight. Uh, the point, though, is to name four members uh, to uh, empower the, uh, the second hearing that a, st a standing committee would enjoy. Um, because I don't think that we're going to resolve the towing issue with one additional committee hearing. So that was my idea. I'm not sure we, I, I'm, I'm not sure how that changes what happens on the 5th. Um, do you want to have a substantive discussion of, of predatory towing next week? Uh, oh, I see. Are there people who were not in the room at the Committee of the Whole who you would like to be uh, notified so they have an opportunity to speak? In other words, have stakeholders been approached? Do you want them approached? And if so, we, we can try to do that. Uh, I so, think it would be good to notify everyone who is of interest. So you intend to have a substantive discussion next week, but it won't be the last one on the issue? Uh, I would turn to my colleagues to ask if they want to have a substantive discussion at second reading or if they will prefer to recommit uh, the towing ordinance to uh, a new committee. Uh, I'm taking any comments. Councilmember Flaherty. I, I think the suggestion of creating an ad hoc committee that is the same as what might be uh, under the standing com committee proposal is an appropriate way to deal with this. I don't, and if, if that is indeed what we decide to do as a council, uh, I would suggest that we don't hear um, substantive debate on the issue on February 5th and instead refer it to that ad hoc committee, thinking specifically about um, the folks who are in the room on our meeting on the 22nd and or any other members of the public or staff that we're going to reach out to, trying to minimize the number of meetings at which they would be uh, required or requested. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Any other comments on my left? Point of clarification. Uh, we're talking about a motion that will take place next week. I know it's speculative. Um, if there is a committee, would it meet on the 12th? That is a night where for a committee of the whole, or well, usually for committees, and you'll have a land use committee, I anticipate right. taking up uh, a PUD that will go out in your packet this week. Is that a night where we'll also talk about uh, this committee might be talk about predatory towing with the public? That's the idea. There would be so it's land the, use at, say, 545, and then at 8 o'clock would be this. So it would be on, on uh, Wednesday the 12th. And so this is the time if people inquire about when the matter will come up, staff can say, please uh, uh, stay tuned and come, in on, come here on the 12th. I mean, I would recommend uh, the same schedule that we did tonight, a 545 land use committee hearing, followed by okay. an 8 o'clock hearing Thank of you. the That's helpful. ad hoc committee. Yeah. Are there any other uh, comments on this idea? Councilmember Sims. But it is possible to move forward on the 5th without forwarding it to an ad hoc committee. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, my concern is that There would be value in ad hoc committee if there was many, many, many unknowns. Um, but as, as the sponsor carrying it forward um, for previous council members, there are a couple of issues. Um, one being the, the fee difference um, from vendors. Um, and I think there were some licensing issues and maybe um, uh, those fees. So 
I think there are a couple issues that can be resolved with their comment and our decision making. So I'm not so sure the most efficient thing is to move that forward to a, a, a task force committee. Um, I, I just not, as we said earlier, complicated and um, controversy. I don't, I know on the surface it may have seemed that way, but the information we need, I think, are just a couple items that shouldn't really prolong the process. Thank you, Councilmember Sims. Other comment? Councilmember Flaherty? Just a question from Council Member, for Councilmember Sims. Uh, would you imagine voting on some sort of final version as amended next week at the meeting on February 5th? I think that's the, oh, my answer. Yeah. I, think, I think that would be the will of the council. Um, and depending on if the issues and questions that the councils have are satisfied at that time. Um, and we, I just heard substantive, substantive debate and I'm not so sure quite what that means. Um, are there new issues? Are there, you know, there's certain things that were discussed, but are there new issues that should be discussed or were there just one or two differences that we can work out quicker? It's my concern. Um, I will offer that uh, what I heard in the room that night was um, a number of ideas uh, coming from a variety of sources um, and some people speaking for people who weren't in the room. Um, and the conclusion I came to was that there needed to be a frank back and forth discussion among the many people who are involved in the concerns over towing. And that's why I thought that it was going to make sense to have a committee uh, consider it because, again, committees uh, are informal. They benefit from the less formal process. And we can actually have a back and forth conversation in committee if we so choose. And uh, I felt like, I, just as, not as president, but just as one member listening committee the whole, I felt like uh, there were more than enough questions that it warranted taking more time. Um, so uh, I still would prefer that it be referred to committee. If it isn't, uh, it could be taken up in second reading on February 5th. If the full council is still not satisfied, they can uh, postpone to a third reading on February 19th. Uh, but I would prefer that it go to a schedule where it's referred to a, an ad hoc committee that has the option of hearing it on the 12th and the 26th, and that it would come back for final action on March the 4th. Are there any further comments on this? Is it, or we have a motion? Uh, just a point of clarification. Uh, maybe uh, there could be a motion where you direct staff regarding their communications with the public on what will happen on the February 5th. I'm hearing two approaches. You know, one is let's move it to a committee for uh, informal deliberations. The other is we have a chance to narrow issues at a public meeting next week. Different audiences in the room, so uh, I, I would need some guidance from you if you can provide me. If you're asking us to make a motion now and not to decide on February 5th, then we may have to, to have that motion now. Is that your intent? I'm asking for guidance from the council uh, regarding our communications to the public. They'll want to know what's going to happen next week, and I'm hearing two different stories. So some clarification, so um, Mr. Sims, would you like to make a motion yeah. uh, to your end? I'm not so sure what that motion would be since we'll be talking about it next week anyway. I take it back. We're gonna, he's right. So we, there no. would need to be a motion to refer to an ad hoc committee now. No, that ad hoc uh, committee has not been established. It's, it's oh. ad hoc. It's, it's established. It ad hoc. Yeah, it's a definition of ad hoc. I am just thinking about the public, who should be in the room, uh, a motion regard to what we tell the public regarding what's going to happen next week. So uh, uh, what we've done in the past, I'll tell you, is, is uh, after hearing from the council, talking to the president, if the matter's to uh, move it to a committee, we have a little note on the agenda saying a motion to refer to a committee 
uh, without discussion is anticipated, something like that. Uh, but I'm, I think I'm that not would do for now. hearing that from you at this point. I'm hearing, uh, let's see how far we can proceed next week and how if, we refer. If, so I need if some a motion guidance. to refer to committee is anticipated, I think that would be adequate notice. Uh, without discussion. Without discussion. If, if you were to make that, I think that would be, I mean, that, that doesn't mean the motion will be adopted. No, it's just so, some guidance that we can share with the public. Yes. And uh, is there any objection to that designation being made by Mr. Sherman? Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Uh, yes, it may be misleading. Uh, I hear at least one member of council who is the sponsor of this legislation who would like to have discussion of it next Wednesday. So if the motion fails, then we might not have the right people in the room for the discussion. That's why I, I would need some guidance from you. Okay, uh, well, somebody needs to make a motion. I'm asking. Point, point of order, is it appropriate to vote on a motion on this tonight when the legislation wasn't um, subject of the agenda? Does that matter? Mr. Sherman. We've done this in the past. Uh, it is, uh, you, you're in a, a noticed meeting, it is, the, this legislation is under, it's under the rubric of schedule. So, um, so new territory for me. I, I'm, I'm at a point where I'm just looking, how do we, what do we set, tell the public at this point? Mr. Sims. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sherman, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems as if it's properly noticed and it's on the agenda. Um, then the appropriate staff will have been informed. And in this particular case, it would be our council attorney staff and Mr. Rooker, I think some legal staff folks. So it's just like anything else, if we notice it, put it on the agenda and re ask that the staff affecting that particular ordinance um, or yeah. resolution be uh, present that that yeah. don't strike me as being different than anything we've ever done in the past thank you for your patience uh, it will appear on your agenda next week based upon the motion made um, the due pass recommendation you made last week so that's how it's getting there that agenda is approved by the president so uh, you there are nine of you in the room we're talking about council schedule uh, if you have a definite idea about how you want to proceed next week regarding that item, um, that can inform the president. Uh, uh, it is odd, that's correct, that we don't have under council schedule ordinance, you know, 20, oh, whatever it is to talk about. So that's unusual. Uh, so, uh, but I'm hearing two different directions okay. from the council. Uh, uh, Councilor Sandberg. When this was being discussed initially, my understanding from all the good questions that were generated from hearing from the towers themselves and the staff who were here, I thought there was going to be some discussion between them, the professional staff, uh, as to what kind of new things the, 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 that were introduced to the mix could be forward. So my question to all of you is, has anybody been in touch with the players, the stakeholders, to see what they have come up with between themselves that would be an improvement to what we all heard and were not completely satisfied with. So oh, ad hoc yeah. committees, I think, is adding a little bit of confusion yeah. to the mix. We're not even there yet. We've not even approved this idea of standing committees yet. And again, I want to make sure that the professional staff and the stakeholders who brought up all the great questions and concerns, are they communicating appropriately to bring to us, the decision makers, something that we can vote on? Or are we supposed to design it? Is it now our jobs to do the work of staff? I, I, that's my question. Thank, Thank you, Councilmember Sandberg. Councilmember Scambaluri. Yeah, no, she was done. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So just to make sure I'm understanding what you're needing, from a public's perspective, they will want to know, the public will want to know whether or not they'll have an opportunity to comment next week. Yes. Is that, is that correct? Um, and can we not have that in a meeting in which we might also refer to committee? Yes, can, you could do so that. So 
could we could we indicate that on the agenda? There will, in whatever language you think is appropriate, there will be opportunities for public comment on this. Um, yes, you could. And there is a possibility that this could be referred to committee. I would rather err in the direction of giving public more opportunities to comment rather than fewer, um, if that makes sense. And then we still have the option for the ad hoc if we want it. I, th that suits me. I don't know if any, because that doesn't require a motion. Uh, that, that works for me. Mr. Sherman, does it work for you? Ms. Thank Ms. you. Um, Wait, um, and just to follow up too, and are you also asking for specific feedback on to whom we would like to reach out in the community? That would be great. We ha I have some idea from based upon your discussions that's last that's week, but if okay. you... Um, I mean, I don't have something in mind right now, but may we share what that I, with you? What I heard were landlords in the downtown. They were not in the room, and some of you wanted to know how this would affect them. Um, so if you want to just um, give feedback to staff, we can uh, relay that to uh, stake, uh, interested parties and, and say, if you want to comment next week, please come and uh, may well be referred to a committee. And may I? I'd please. like to also recommend that we reach out to Downtown Bloomington, Inc. Um, yes, please, we can do that. And an, extend an invitation to comment on this particular ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all comments well taken. I think that it uh, obviates the need for a motion that we will take it up in some form on February 5th, even if we do decide ultimately to refer to a committee. That works for me too. Yeah. Mr. Sherman. Again, thank you for your patience. That was very helpful. We can relay that to the public. Last, it's just a confirmation. Uh, over the last few months, the city and county elected officials, some of them have met to talk about the convention center. I understand that there's another meeting coming up, and if I'm correct, that's on Monday, February 10th at 5 p.m. Um, and since this room is being occupied by the plan commission, I imagine it will be in the Natu Hill room. That's correct. If I confirm that information with the county, do I have permission to get that notice out this Friday just because that's our usual uh, release and I won't be able to do it the following Friday because it's too quick. Yes, please, in case anyone doesn't know, the continued discussion over a capital improvement board will be held on February 10th at 5 p.m. the Nat Hill Room and I would urge uh, staff to please all right. place notice of it. Thank and you. All, all members are encouraged to attend that meeting. All right, thank uh, you. With that we go, if, that's, if we have no other business, all in favor of adjournment say aye. 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 We are adjourned, thank you. <laughs>